Good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are. This is Bill Maddox, another in the series of SMDP webinars. Glad you're able to join us today. Uh, we have a great, topic, interesting topic, very uh, timely in terms of what's going on in market development, market facilitation. I'll get to the description of our webinar and our webinar speaker in just a minute, but I want to tell you about a few other events that are happening uh, here at CARSI and SMVP, um, just so you're aware and can hold, jump on. Um, I want to remind uh, anybody who is interested in coming to beautiful New Hampshire in June that we still have uh, openings for the SMDP New Hampshire certificate. Uh, the date of the certificate this year are uh, going to be Sunday, June 21st through Saturday, June 27th. Um, the program um, has, as, as in years, is going to include uh, some of the, the voices of the microfinance field. Both will be here in the classroom in Durham and also join us um, virtually. Um, we're covering a pretty wide range of topics, uh, focusing in on you know where microfinances come from, but also looking at where we're going, most importantly, where the uh, field of microfinance uh, is, is going and some of the real challenges that uh, the field is, is facing. Um, within the actual uh, phase of the SMV New Hampshire, we're going to have a couple of webinars, which we're really excited about. On um, Wednesday, um, the – what is this, sorry? Wednesday, the 24th of June. Um, we're my, uh, microfinance Transparency, MFT, um, will be the topic. Chuck Waterfield, who is the founder of Microfinance Transparency, uh, has announced recently that he's going to be leaving. Um, he's going to be kind of winding down the MFT uh, price transparency uh, facilities that have really been kind of, uh, fascinating and essential part of how microfinance has been able to recover some of its uh, – uh, ethical and uh, moral high ground uh, following uh, the uh, Thomas uh, IPO debacle and um, AS crisis and other things that have gone on. So we're going to be uh, inviting Chuck into the classroom for the SMDP uh, certificate program and to a wider webinar world that you'll be a, able to be a part of. Um, you'll be able to listen to Chuck and talk about MFT and its impact and what he's able to accomplish and where um, the whole cost transparency is going to go without MFT being there as a guiding light. Computer, we're going to go within the SMDP, but a webinar to in the business of good. This is a book discussion with Anton Simonowitz, who, with Karnatz, has uh, written a, a short but really interesting book about AMK and Cambodia and um, really catalogs what you can do um, to correctly align your microfinance institution with finance. Uh, uh, funny that um, we've strayed from that in some major ways, and here's an opportunity to learn from you know someone I think that's really made it, uh, to not to make too big a pun here, but impact on microfinance as the head of the impact consortium. Uh, that's really been uh, helpful in in um, focusing in on what kind of changes are we making in people's lives and how do you measure uh, the impact that uh, microfinance makes. So I'm really excited to have him be part of that webinar, which will be um, – both of these are announced on the SMDP webinar page. Um, so go ahead and um, make sure that you uh, tune in. Um, also um, excited to point out webinar today, which uh, Mary Morgan will be presenting in a minute. I'll tell you about Mary in, in just a second. Uh, is part of two online courses that we're offering here uh, at CARSI uh, School of Public Policy, SMDP. Um, Mary's going to tell you in detail about her course, which is Understanding and Adapting to Complex mar Markets. Um, and that course will be starting on the 29th of June. I said you'll hear more about that shortly. Uh, we're also offering uh, a blended course, Savings Groups Building Scale Impact through uh, adaptation and experimentation. Um, this will be facilitated by Nancy Lee uh, on June 15th. And um, as a blended course, this is a course that's going to take place uh, online for four and a half months. Um, it's specifically for safe practitioners who are working in the field. 
uh, who to be able to um, have the opportunity to both learn online and then meet face to face at the SMDP Zia, which will be taking place uh, October 26th through November 6th uh, in um, Lusaka, Zambia. Uh, this course, the blended course that uh, Nancy will be facilitating, will be meeting from um, November 2nd to November 6th and carry on the um, the field version of the work uh, that was being done online and being able to take some of those concepts to the field and apply them. So we're really excited about both of these programs, and I want to make it clear that we have scholarships. We have scholarships for uh, both online programs for uh, African women practitioners. These are from the MasterCard Foundation Microsoft Scholars Program. Uh, there's still several opportunities to um, uh, participate in this. So if you're not a woman practitioner from Africa, you can also register and uh, be uh, a regular participant. Um, we give discounts for multiple participants. And um, if you're really interested in taking one of the courses and um, finance a problem, then let's discuss with you the possibility of you um, taking the course. Um, even if you can't make the full tuition amount, we'll see what, what we can work out. Uh, we're really excited about um, this new uh, opportunity for uh, RP courses, which many of you have really enjoyed, and many of you have really um, been participants, and a lot of you listen to these webinars have been in our face to face uh, courses, um, to be able to take these online and, and reach many more people and uh, still keep the high level of interaction that we've had. So um, I'm really happy to introduce Mary Morgan. Uh, Mary has been involved in uh, human rights and economic development work since the uh, mid 1980s. Um, she worked doing human rights work with El Grupo de Apoyo Mucho por Aparcimiento con Vida de Nuestros Familiares, the GAM, in Guadalajara. Very important uh, work. But along the way, Mary um, learned that change also happens uh, in a very sense in the economic sector. So following participatory techniques, uh, Mary has been successful in transferring knowledge and building capacity with professionals uh, facilitating systemic change in markets, including vulnerable populations as um, suppliers and consumers, and her work span the globe from Eastern Europe and Asia, Central South America, Africa, and even in downtown Vancouver and Eastside. Um, Mary has a wealth of experience um, on a very practical level, and I think what we're talking about today are uh, looking at um, taking some of the uh, kind of esoteric and, and more theoretical ideas around complex systems um, and adaptive systems theory and looking at how that um, really will, um, can be applied to understanding markets in a, a, a much more nuanced and I think in some ways a much more uh, useful way, uh, kind of moving away from the uh, value chain development and other um, strategies that really kind of looked at things in a static way, uh, looking at markets in a much more dynamic way. So I think you're really going to enjoy this webinar. Um, as we uh, in the past, there will be a couple of um, polls that we'll want you to participate in. So watch your screen and watch the little clock and um, vote right away, and then we can tell you the results of the polls. We also have an opportunity to um, ask very questions. We're going to uh, try to do open mic, which means if you want to ask a question, what I would encourage you to do is to type it into the box, uh, the Q&A box, which you should see on the right of your screen. Um, what's going to happen is I'm going to uh, write back, and I'm going to say, would you like to ask your question on mic? And if you say yes, then uh, I'll let you know when your mic is going to be opened and you can ask the question. You can listen uh, to me as I will be um, unmuted and I will be saying to Mary, okay, um, Bob from Omaha is going to ask the question. And um, then I'll open up Bob's mic and Bob can ask the question. Um, if Bob from Omaha doesn't want to ask a question, let me just ask the question which he types in, then we can do it way too. But I want to give you the opportunity to uh, talk directly to Mary and ask a question and even a follow-up if you'd like, uh, make it a little bit more dynamic. So I've been talking for quite long enough. Um, we're very excited to be able to introduce Mary Morgan and uh, her webinar, Markets from a Complex Adaptive Systems Perspective. Mary. Thanks a lot, Bill. It's so great to be here. And thanks a lot to everybody for showing up. 
and taking time out of your busy day. So, uh, yeah, the intention of this webinar is to deconstruct some systems concepts and then applying them to some market development uh, realities that we all face out in the field. And so that you have an idea of what we're going to be learning in the course. And um, at the end of the presentation, I will present the topics being covered in each module of the course. So I thought we'd just start off with a question here. How did you start working in inclusive economic development? So on your poll thing, just check off the appropriate. Did you start with MED, Microenterprise Development, BDS? Or yes. yes. Uh, you need to accept control because we can't see your screen yet. Okay, sorry. Uh, let's see, how do I do that? Um, there, there wasn't for me to push. Screen? No, there wasn't one. Stand by, folks. Technical glitch. Little technical glitch. because it should be somewhere some screen okay let's see and the screens here it says speak now it says I'm connected there's nothing that says I should oh I am now the presenter okay, okay. Um, that up at four and can you see my screen but there's nothing that asks me to share my screen Okay, we go. There. Okay. Like it's appearing. Uh, is that working, yep. gang? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, sorry about that, gang. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Okay, so here we are. So I won't have to go over that again. But And the poll questions, you've got them up on your screen. So if you could check it in. I'd, I'm just curious to see how we all got into, you know, how we got to be where we are today in the field. So, yeah, I just kind of want to go over what about the shifting and evolving field. So, I mean, we've really moved um, in the last 40 years, starting off with rural development in the 60s and 70s, and that was looking at agro-industrial development that they tried to include the poor. Then we realized that actually they start their own little business and micro-enterprise development, income-generating activities, late 70s and 90s. That was also the time that microcredit came onto the scene. Then we had business development services in the 90s, 2004, because we realized that these microenterprises actually needed assistance in how to become more competitive and um, market oriented. Then moved into the value chain approach in 2004 because BS, we were focusing on individual businesses and we didn't have much impact. We just had like about 100 would reach 100, 150 people, but in the value chain approach, then we were looking, starting at um, uh, from a more systemic approach, and then the value chain approach was adapted by uh, from Michael Porter's work. Um, then we had making markets work for the poor. Interestingly enough, the value chain approach was cha championed by uh, um, SAID and making markets work for the poor by DFID and SDC. Uh, they both arose at the same time, and market, making markets work for the poor, M4P, is more, more of a conceptual framework with the value chain at the core of it. And recently, in 2009, we actually started, uh, it started percolating in our discussions about moving away from a vertical sort of uh, deterministic approach to something that's more descriptive and understanding that it's way more complex than what we thought it was. and that. That is in the MAFI discussions that I started to learn about this, and MAFI is the Market Facilitation Initiative, a great LinkedIn discussion group. And who knows where we're going next, but I just present this as a little diagram so that everybody can see that we, it, this isn't just a new place, new jargon. We've evolved into this, and we have moved from individual a system approach and the whole thing right now though is moving it more into a holistic approach of looking at doing our work. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go through some uh, systems concepts and apply them 
to the uh, to market develop. And the first thing I know in system thinking is is the function, input process and output. Um, a system is defined by its function. Oops. Oh, okay, we do. We have the poll. Hey, fabulous. So in the poll here, it looks like that most people uh, came in with MED. Well, that's great. So you've been around for a while and you've also done lots of work. Uh, that's great. Thanks for doing that. Okay, so yeah, getting back here, the system's defined by its function, which is the process that transforms elements from one state to, oops, doesn't seem to move forward here. Oh, there we go. Uh, yeah, then we have, um, so the functions, uh, function is the process that transforms elements from one state to another. So then we have inputs. Inputs are energy or resources. Yeah, okay. Inputs are energy or resources that are brought into the system's boundary, like fertilizer and agriculture, or cobalt for cell phones, uh, or internal consultants to look at a project. And then we have um, the process this is the transformation of the input into an output. Um, any given system can only process a specific range of inputs. For instance, the dairy system needs the input of milk to transform it into ice cream, butter, yogurt, kefir, etc. Well, milk is not an input for the system. So um, it's the boundary actually filters what comes into the, the system's function. I'm going to explain boundary in the next one. Processes aren't necessarily linear. They may be cyclical, feeding each on each other with the output from one process being the input to another. An output from a market system perspective is the transform input that comes to the final consumer. So very, we have been working in this I mean, value chain actually is very similar to this. Um, but what we're in here is looking at um, like boundary and then what's coming into this boundary and what's going out of the boundary. So let's talk about boundary a bit. The boundary separates the system, so the market that we're looking at, from its environment. The environment contains some elements and further systems that interact in some way with what we're looking at, with the um, system that we're working in. Of a system, which is the input process output, defines the boundary of the system. And it's the integrity of the system, and which describes really integrity is when the parts are all working together. And we know in our work, the integrity of many of the market systems we're working in are pretty nebulous because elements aren't working together. For instance, you know, the old added, or what we all know and have had experience with, is how a smallholder farmers scattered and isolated, or even buyers who don't have any idea how to access input produced by the smallholders. Integrity gives the system the degree of autonomy from others. A market boundary. So the boundary of a market system includes not only the functions of the input processing output, it also includes processes that may be seen you know, we say, oh, no, that's outside of the actual market. And um, when we were in the value chain approach, we started to look at the business enabling environment, but it was almost like an add-on or an adage rather than thinking that it's actually part of the whole market system. But these process and elements are really have a, uh, are very influential in shaping the integrity of the market system of how everybody works together. And so this graphic is from the M4P operational guide and illustrates really well the elements included in a market system. For instance, supportive functions, the technology, infrastructure, information, um, have the rules. They tell us how to behave in a market also, and they also shape the internal, uh, the, the, things work. For instance, the informal rules, the norms, formal rules, regulations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the same functions and the rules provide supports for the system to actually work together efficiently. 
Well, that's the purpose of it. Now, sometimes we will find, and there's a little case study we'll be looking at where some of the rules and formal rules actually do not assist markets to work very well or the system to work very well. So they become instructions. And anyways, we'll talk about that in a minute. So let's look here. We're going to do this little case study here um, of a market system boundary. So uh, this is, um, we're going to look at SDC Mercy Corps uh, Market Alliance Against Poverty Program in South Georgia. So the goal of this uh, program is to increase household incomes for the rural poor and increasing their equity Equality was one of the project's cross-cutting themes, and based on a feasibility study, the livestock sector was selected for its potential of increasing participation of the poor, and within the livestock sector, the dairy subsector was selected because of high participation of women, and so they were able to target the poor and women in, in the sector. We're going to do a little... Um, I'm going to illustrate through illustrations sort of what happened there and how they had they came up with the boundary for their for their project. So the alliance has investigated the underlying causes of the low quality of milk supplied by dairy farmers who were women, so they were women dairy farmers, to the cheese factories. It found that the local government allocated development based on the priorities of men who in community and municipality meetings. Women hardly participated and did not voice their priorities, which included having sufficient access to running water they needed for their tasks and dairy farming. And the municipality matters were not their concern and didn't feel that they had a right to access local government services or information. And likewise, the municipalities didn't encourage or invite the women to participate in meetings because they didn't feel that the women had anything to contribute. So women were excluded from local decision making, which resulted in no funds being allocated for running water for farms, and contributed to low hygiene for the cows, low quality and quantity milk, then resulting in a loss of income and increased household insecurity. So there was no product; the product just wasn't being developed. So the need for improving women's access to running water and farms and improve the functioning of the dairy market system, the Alliance's project made use of the gender equality le legislation. This obliged local authorities to include women in consultations on budget allocations and to introduce other gender-sensitive measures. There was no enforcement of legislation when the project um, was initiating. So, so um, started working with the authorities to, you know, implement um, the the legislation. So with women, then participating, the running water um, was the money was provided for the running water, and this made for healthier cows. That was more will milk, which in turn increased household incomes and security. And as a result, households investing in livestock, both for existing cattle in terms of breeding, nutrition, and veterinary inputs, and in terms of retaining or buying more cattle. And some systemic change in the whole market. Four cheese factories can now source 900 households. Uh, three cheese factories have crowded in. The consultancy firm that taught the women about hygiene and pro um, provided TA directly to the women producers has been selected as an official government supplier of food safety and hygiene training to companies receiving government loans. And of course, at the household level, the direct fisheries, they have a stable daily income. And this little case study illustrates how the boundary of a market system goes way beyond pure transactions where supply and demand meet. So yeah, they achieved and they found the right leverage point, but it is a leverage point. So leverage points are all about where we intervene so that it affects systemic change. We want to find the point where we can nudge the system and the nudge will influence change in the entire system. So finding optimal leverage points to affect systemic change requires that we listen to the feedback, which we'll look at in the next slide. The leverage point in the Georgia project with the cheese market system was shifting the paradigm shaped by informal rules dictated that women do not belong 
in the public realm and part of the decision making process at the community level participate in the decision making process. Starting with advocacy and assisting the authorities to implement the gender equality law that was not being enforced, which turned then shifted world views to include women in decision making at the local government level, which then allowed for the 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 water to come and then we had increased production, et cetera, et cetera. So that leverage point, um, shifting paradigms and worldviews is the is the most potent leverage point, and that um, Meadows talks about that in her book, The Sisters Primer. So feedback. So what is this feedback? Feedback is one of the main concepts in systems thinking. Feedback exists between two parts. Each other affects the other. Now, complex systems. And we isolate feedback only between two parts. There are many parts that are affecting each other and giving us feedback. We have to look at the whole system and map out the feedback loops. So there are two types of feedback loops, reinforcing and balancing, which we'll look at now. Now, reinforcing um, is an action which produces a, uh, a result it seems to reinforce other actions, and there's more of the same. They end up in growth that becomes declined because it's not sustainable to maintain constant growth. Things all change, right? So let's just see that in practice. Now, this is uh, this little example is coming from a blog post uh, from the C blog post uh, where the interview with Adam Keats from FinTrack. And about you know, where there were uh, the output bars wouldn't invest in rural development or extension in the supply, uh, and because the supply didn't meet the quality or quantity standards, but farmers they meet output market standards without improved inputs, and it invest inputs if output. Um, Opportunities were limited. So here we have this vicious circus. And then the input supplies, they weren't going to invest in rural distribution or farm training because no perceived demand for their products, but the farmers weren't consistently investing in improved inputs because they can't return from the inputs that buy because they don't have any buyers. And then financial providers, they won't extend credit because farmers are incapable of repayment. But farmers can invest in new inputs without access to credit, and they can't repay loans without access to output markets. So this is a reinforcing loop. And there is one that we, this is common, this is the kind of thing we're seeing all the time. Let's have another poll question here. Where do you think the leverage points are that will influence systemic change in the FinTrack? case study, working with input suppliers, should we start there, should we start with the output bars, or should we start with working with local partners to design appropriate financial products? So, get, you know, take a moment and just, just let's see what you have to say about that. Oops, okay, where are we here? What I have to do here? Oops, we Okay. 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 Here, just have, I'm having a problem just changing the. Oh, it doesn't want to change here. Okay. Okay. So the next one we're going to look at then is the balancing feedback loop. Now, balancing loop is an action that emerges. Um. Or that kind of slows down the runaway action of the reinforcing feedback loop. So it's it's important when we are looking at a balancing loop, when we start to analyze, like if we look at the reinforcing loop that we just looked at, uh, we want to figure out, okay, where can we intervene and why? It's really important to ensure that there's an explicit, well understood, and agreed upon definition of the desired state. Like, where do we want to get to? If we want to increase incomes for the farmers, where is it that we're going to intervene? and uh, to balance out that vicious 
circle from from continuing of, of continuous decline for the farmers and the whole market system. And instead of any situation where there's a goal or an objective. So when we are actually designing our inventions, what we're doing is designing a balancing feedback loop so that we can start to make shifts in the runway enforcing loop. The example. So I, this is just uh, the, the, the from this one. So this, this is the reinforcing um, back loop. And I state that we're looking for as professionals in this little case study here is to improve incomes, which in this case requires improved production and to meet those needs. So I'm proposing that we what well, is a threefold um, response starting with. Uh, facilitating the development of financial product that's appropriate and accessible, but the farms that then so they can purchase the inputs needed, and then be buyer credit or savings group or agriculture loan product product from an FM, MFI or maybe even value chain finance, so that you actually give more money to buyers, so they have more cash to buy from the farmers. Whatever it, it would require an analysis, of course. But that balance, so by going in there, by find, you know, if we look at, at uh, by creating these financial products, then it makes the, the accessible financial products, which then leads to investing in more inputs. The next thing I would do is work with the input suppliers um, to make sure that we've got, um, um, yeah, make sure that there's accessible quality uh, inputs for the farmers to purchase now that they have the capital to do it. Um, and, you know, that would be working with inputs. There's a great example in uh, Bangladesh with Catalyst with their vegetable sector and how they work with seed suppliers um, and they work, they actually trained or work with the corporation that learned about training their their retailers, and then that increased sales for the for the corporation, the seed corporation, and it also made it access seeds accessible to the poor farmers. Now there'll be a delay in this. That's what those two lines are, um, because yeah, they get the inputs, quality of the product. You're going to take a while, like the life cycle of the growing cycle, rather, to show that there is quality and the quantity can improve, and then. I work with the the buyers and facilitate rural procurement. So these are all balancing, but we if we just focused on one, it worked. Focused on we have to look at several and remember in the last one um, we were talking about feedback in complex systems. There's just one feedback loop. There's lots, and we have to analyze the whole system. So here, this gives us an idea, this little graphic of, okay, where are the places we can intervene and where are the leverage points, but this would have to be done with um, sequencing. And let's see here, people. Yes, number two, working with the MFIs. That's great. So we're all on the same track here. Okay, so those some conceptual uh, systems concepts and how they would be applied to market development and we would be learning more of those things when we're doing the course. So now I'm going to start. Uh, hey, I hope I can start. Well, how do I get going here? Let's see. Oh, there we go. Okay, so let's look at what the course looks like, uh, the learning objectives. Uh, module one is going to be, the actual content will start on the 29th of June, but module one is when you will be uh, in that into the in the course, and you'll start learning um, about the learning management system which we're using, which is Canvas. And you'll be uh, there'll be exercises um, for you to learn about participating in discussions, posting documents, downloading documents, um, and different features that we'll be working with. It's really important that everybody takes the time to go through these exercises so that when we do get into the content, we're ready to go. Module two, we're looking at markets as a system. So we're, we'll be looking at the, 
you'll be able to explain the components of a market. Mr. Audio, you do have audio. Um, hmm, interesting. Contact with Vancouver, stand by. Um, Very necked. Can you hear me? We see lost the connection. Hi. Can you hear us? Okay. Imagine happy music playing right now. I'm going to actually mute mic and try to contact Mary. Okay. All right, we seem to uh, raise Mary on her phone. Um, she seems to have lost Mary as um, in our list. Maybe she's reconnecting, so stand by a little more. Hope we can get her back. Um, um, I'd like to be able to have some questions. If you didn't, I'm going to type it into the Q&A box. Which we hope to. Up oh, here we go. Nope, Mary. Okay. Okay. Well, I shouldn't. Uh, um, I'm going to continue the webinar because of these technical. Um, but let the uh, Mary's on the 29th of. June. Um, we'll be accepting applications for the next two or three weeks. Um, as I said, we do have master scholarships for this course that would cover the entire cost of the course for African women practitioners. So please spread the word if you're not necessarily um, uh, be eligible. Please spread the word to those who might be. Um, and I, I think it's a really engaging and, and really interesting course. Uh, I'm very excited about it. Um, as I said, if you're interested in the course and uh, the price of the course seems to be more you can afford, uh, contact me, Bill Maddox, bm.max at una.edu. Uh, we'll see if we can uh, work out something that will make it possible for you. Um, all right, we'll apologize for the difficulty with the sound. We don't know what's happened to Mary, but Vancouver is on black at this point. And uh, maybe a major power outage, or maybe it's just Mary's computer. Who knows? I um, want to just remind you of two upcoming webinars uh, on um, the Wednesday, June 24th. We'll have uh, uh, Chuck Water with us. Um, actually, we're going to have a co-host that day, Candace Nelson, who some of you know, uh, involved with SEEP Network and been involved in this work for many years, is going to... Uh, be on with uh, 
uh, uh, microfinance transparency, its origins, impact, and future. Um, opportunity to ask Chuck about the future of, of microfinance transparency, not only the organization, but what did happen in terms of uh, product being and interest rates and no, knowing uh, the kind of information consumers need to know to make informed choices. Uh, four days later, the business of doing good book discussion on uh, the 26th, um, Anton Samanowitz, um, check our webinar page shortly. We'll have descriptions of those webinars. Um, very good opportunity to interact directly with uh, of Chuck Waterfield on um, and with Anton Samanowitz, who is author of this great uh, new book that's come out about AMP in Cambodia. So please join us. We appreciate you tuning in and apologize for the technical difficulty today. I uh, hope you will tune into future SMDP webinars. And wish you all a great day. Thank you much and goodbye.